Simon & Schuster Audio presents The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life by Richard J. Herrnstein and Charles Murray. Richard J. Herrnstein received his Ph.D. in psychology at Harvard, where he began teaching in 1958, and where he held the Edgar Pierce Chair in Psychology until his death in 1994. Charles Murray is a graduate of Harvard and received his Ph.D. in political science from MIT. Currently a Bradley Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, he is the author of Losing Ground, American Social Policy, 1950 to 1980. Here is Charles Murray. This audio program is about differences in intellectual capacity among people and groups and what those differences mean for America's future. The relationships that Richard Herrnstein and I will be examining here are among the most sensitive in contemporary America, so sensitive that hardly anyone writes about them or talks about them in public. It's not for lack of information, as you will see. On the contrary, knowledge about the connections between intelligence and American life has been accumulating for years, available in the journals held by any good university library and on the computer tapes and disks of public-use databases. People have shied away from the topic for many reasons. Some think that the concept of intelligence has been proved a fraud. Others recall totalitarian eugenic schemes based on IQ scores or worry about such schemes arising once the subject breaks into the open. Many fear that discussing intelligence will promote racism. The friends and colleagues whose concerns we take most seriously say something like this. Yes, we acknowledge that intelligence is important and that people differ, but the United States is founded on the principle that people should be equal under the law. So what possible relevance can individual differences in intelligence have to public policy? In answer, we ask these friends, and you, the listener, to share for a moment our view of the situation, perhaps suppressing some doubts and assuming as true things that we will subsequently try to prove are true. Here is our story. A great nation founded on principles of individual liberty and self-government that constitute the crowning achievement of statecraft, approaches the end of the 20th century. Equality of rights has been implanted more deeply and more successfully than in any other society in history. Yet even as the principle of equal rights triumphs, strange things begin to happen to two small segments of the population. In one segment, life gets better in many ways. The people in this group are welcomed at the best colleges, then at the best graduate and professional schools, regardless of their parents' wealth. After they complete their education, they enter fulfilling and prestigious careers. Their incomes continue to rise, even when income growth stagnates for everyone else. Technology works in their behalf, expanding their options and their freedom, putting unprecedented resources at their command, enhancing their ability to do what they enjoy doing. And as these good things happen to them, they gravitate to one another, increasingly enabled by their affluence and by technology to work together and live in one another's company and in isolation from everybody else. In the other group, life gets worse, and its members collect at the bottom of society. Poverty is severe, drugs and crime are rampant, and the traditional family all but disappears. Economic growth passes them by, Technology is not a partner in their lives, but an electronic opiate. They live together in urban centers or scattered in rural backwaters, but their presence hovers over the other parts of town and countryside as well, creating fear and resentment in the rest of society that is seldom openly expressed, but festers nonetheless. Pressures from these contrasting movements at the opposite ends of society put terrific stress on the entire structure. Numerically, the people at each end are a small minority of the overall population. The mass of the nation is in the center, and the resulting pattern is known as a bell curve. In America today, the lives of the majority in the center are increasingly shaped by the power of the fortunate few and the plight of the despairing few. The culture's sense of what is right and wrong, virtuous and mean, attainable and unattainable, most important its sense of how people are to live together, is altered in myriad ways. The fragile web of civility, mutual regard, and mutual obligations at the heart of any happy society begins to tear. In trying to think through what is happening and why, and in trying to understand thereby what ought to be done, the nation's social scientists and journalists and politicians seek explanations. 
They examine changes in the economy, changes in demographics, changes in the culture. They propose solutions founded on better education, on more and better jobs, on specific social interventions. But they ignore an underlying element that has shaped the changes, human intelligence, the way it varies within the American population and its crucially changing role in our destinies during the last half of the 20th century. To try to come to grips with a nation's problems without understanding the role of intelligence is to see through a glass darkly indeed, to grope with symptoms instead of causes, to stumble into supposed remedies that have no chance of working. We are not indifferent to the ways in which our research, wrongly construed, might do harm. We have worried about this from the day we began work. But there can be no real progress in solving America's social problems when they are as misperceived as they are today. What good can come of understanding the relationship of intelligence to social structure and public policy? Little good can come without it. That the word intelligence describes something real, and that it varies from person to person, is as universal and ancient as any understanding about the state of being human. Literate cultures everywhere and throughout history have had words for saying that some people are smarter than others. Given the survival value of intelligence, the concept must be still older than that. Gossip about who in the tribe is cleverest has probably been a topic of conversation around the fire since fires and conversation were invented. Yet for the last 30 years, the concept of intelligence has been a pariah in the world of ideas. The attempt to measure it with tests has been variously dismissed as an artifact of racism, political reactions, statistical bungling, and scholarly fraud. By the 1960s and 1970s, it had somehow become controversial to claim, especially in public, that genes had any effect at all on intelligence. The causes of human deficiencies in intelligence, or parenting, or social behavior, or work behavior, lay outside the individual. They were caused by flaws in society. Sometimes capitalism was blamed. Sometimes an uncaring or incompetent government. Further, the causes of these deficiencies could be fixed by the right public policies redistribution of wealth, better education, better housing, and medical care. Once these environmental causes were removed, the deficiencies should vanish as well, it was argued. The contrary notion, that individual differences could not be easily diminished by government intervention, collided head-on with the enthusiasm for egalitarianism, which itself collided head-on with a half-century of IQ data indicating that differences in intelligence are in fact intractable and significantly heritable, and that the average IQ of various socioeconomic and ethnic groups differs. How much is IQ a matter of genes? The state of knowledge does not permit a precise estimate, but half a century of work, now amounting to hundreds of empirical and theoretical studies, permits a broad conclusion that the genetic component of IQ is unlikely to be smaller than 40% or higher than 80%. The most unambiguous direct estimates, based on identical twins raised apart, produce some of the highest estimates of heritability. For purposes of this discussion, we will adopt a middling estimate of 60% heritability, which, by extension, means that IQ is about 40% a matter of environment. The balance of the evidence suggests that 60% may err on the low side. In analyzing these issues, our focus will be on the relationship of human abilities to public policy. We will be dealing in relationships that are based on aggregated data. For example, suppose the topic is two 11-year-olds, one with an IQ of 110 and one with an IQ of 90. We are asked, what can you tell about the difference between those two children? The answer must be phrased very tentatively. On many important topics, the answer must be, we can tell you nothing with any confidence. It is well worth a guidance counselor's time to know what these individual scores are but only in combination with a variety of other information about the child's personality, talents, and background. The individual's IQ score all by itself is a useful tool, but a limited one. Suppose instead that the question at issue is, given two sixth-grade classes, one for which the average IQ is 110 and the other for which it is 90, what can you tell us about the difference between those two classes and their average prospects for the future? Now there is a great deal to be said, and it can be said with considerable confidence, not about any one person in either class, but about the average outcomes that are important to the school 
educational policy in general, and society writ large. This makes a point so important that we will say it now and repeat it later. Measures of intelligence have reliable statistical relationships with important social phenomena, but they are a limited tool for deciding what to make of any given individual. The IQ score reveals little about whether the human being next to you is someone whom you will admire or cherish. This thing we know as IQ is important, but not a synonym for human excellence. The very word intelligence carries with it undue affect and political baggage. It is still a useful word, but we shall subsequently employ the more neutral term cognitive ability as often as possible to refer to the concept that we have hitherto called intelligence. This, we hope, will help you think of intelligence as just a noun, not an accolade. The 21st century will open on a world in which cognitive ability is the decisive dividing force. Social class remains the vehicle of social life, but intelligence now pulls the train, led by a distinct stratum in the social hierarchy, which we hereby dub the cognitive elite. Stratification by cognitive ability has been weak and inconsistent until this century because the number of very bright people was so much greater than the specialized jobs for which high intelligence is indispensable. A true cognitive elite requires a technological society. This raises a distinction that is worth emphasizing. To say that most of the people in the cognitively demanding positions of a society have a high IQ is not the same as saying that most of the people with high IQs are in such positions. It is possible to have cognitive screening without having cognitive classes. Mathematical necessity tells us that a large majority of the smart people in ancient Egypt, dynastic China, Elizabethan England, and Teddy Roosevelt's America were engaged in ordinary pursuits, mingling, working, and living with everyone else. Many were housewives. Most of the rest were farmers, smiths, millers, and shopkeepers. Social and economic stratification was extreme, but cognitive stratification was minor. So it has been from the beginning of history into this century. Then, comparatively rapidly, with the rise of technology, a new class structure emerged in which it became much more consistently and universally advantageous to be smart. Now, we will examine that process and its meaning. In the course of the 20th century, America opened the doors of its colleges wider than any previous generation of Americans or any other society in history could have imagined possible. The growth in the proportion of people getting college degrees is the most obvious result, with a 15-fold increase from 1900 to 1990. Even more important, the students going to college were being selected ever more efficiently for their high IQ. The crucial decade was the 1950s, when the percentage of top students who went to college rose by more than it had in the preceding three decades. By the beginning of the 1990s, about 80% of all students in the top quartile of ability continued to college after high school. Among the high school graduates in the top few percentiles of cognitive ability, the chance of going to college exceeded 90%. Perhaps the most important of all the changes was the transformation of America's elite colleges. Starting in the 1950s, a handful of institutions became magnets for the very brightest of each year's new class. In these schools, the cognitive level of the students rose far above the rest of the college population. Taken together, these trends have stratified America according to cognitive ability. Education is a powerful divider and classifier. Education affects income, and income divides. Education affects occupation, and occupation divides. Education affects tastes and interests, grammar and accent, all of which divide. When access to higher education is restricted by class, race, or religion, these divisions cut across cognitive levels. But school is in itself, more immediately and directly than any other institution, the place where people of high cognitive ability excel and where people of low cognitive ability fail. As America opened access to higher education, it opened up as well a revolution in the way that the American population sorted itself and divided itself. The news about education is heartening and frightening, more or less in equal measure. Heartening because the nation is providing college education for a high proportion of those who could profit from it. Frightening because 
because when people live in encapsulated worlds, it becomes difficult for them, even with the best of intentions, to grasp the realities of the worlds with which they have little experience, but over which they also have great influence, both public and private. Many of those promising undergraduates are never going to live in a community where they will be disabused of their misperceptions. For after education comes another sorting mechanism, occupation. And many of the holes that are still left in the cognitive partitions begin to get sealed, because people in different jobs have different average IQs. Whatever the reason for the link between IQ and occupation, it goes deep. If you want to guess an adult male's job status, the results of his childhood IQ test help you as much as knowing how many years he went to school. IQ becomes more important as the job gets intellectually tougher. To be able to dig a ditch, you need a strong back, but not necessarily a high IQ score. To be a master carpenter, you need some higher degree of intelligence along with skill with your hands. To be a first-rate lawyer, you had better come from the upper end of the cognitive ability distribution. The same may be said of a handful of other occupations, such as accountants, engineers and architects, college teachers, dentists and physicians, mathematicians and scientists. The mean IQ of people entering those fields is in the neighborhood of 120. In 1900, only one out of 20 people in the top 10% of intelligence were in any of these occupations, a figure that did not change much through 1940. But after 1940, more and more people with high IQs flowed into those jobs, and by 1990, the same handful of occupations employed about 25% of all the people in the top tenth of intelligence. During the same period, IQ became more important for business executives. In 1900, the CEO of a large company was likely to be a wasp born into affluence. He may have been bright, but that was not mainly how he was chosen. Much was still the same as late as 1950. The next three decades saw a great social leveling as the executive suites filled with bright people who could maximize corporate profits and never mind if they came from the wrong side of the tracks or worshipped at a temple instead of a church. Meanwhile, the college degree became a requirement for many business positions and graduate education went from a rarity to a commonplace among senior executives. When one combines the people known to be in high IQ professions with estimates of the numbers of business executives who are drawn from the top tenth in cognitive ability, the results do not leave much room for maneuver. The specific proportions are open to argument, but the main point seems beyond dispute. Even as recently as mid-century, America was still a society in which most bright people were scattered throughout a wide range of jobs. As the century draws to a close, a very high proportion of that same group is now concentrated within a few occupations that are highly screened for IQ. This cognitive partitioning through education and occupations will continue, and there is not much that the government or anyone else can do about it. Economics will be the main reason. At the same time that elite colleges and professional schools are turning out brighter and brighter graduates, the value of intelligence in the marketplace is rising. Wages earned by people in high IQ occupations have pulled away from the wages in low IQ occupations. Another force for cognitive partitioning is the increasing physical segregation of the cognitive elite from the rest of society. Members of the cognitive elite work in jobs that usually keep them off the shop floor, away from the construction site, and close to others who also tend to be smart. Computers and electronic communication make it increasingly likely that people who work mainly with their minds collaborate only with other such people. The isolation of the cognitive elite is compounded by its choices of where to live, shop, play, worship, and send its children to school. Its isolation is intensified by an irony of a mobile and democratic society like America's. Cognitive ability is a function of both genes and environment, with implications for egalitarian social policies. The more we succeed in giving every youngster a chance to develop his or her latent cognitive ability, the more we equalize the environmental sources of differences in intelligence. The irony is that as America equalizes the circumstances of people's lives, the remaining differences in intelligence are increasingly determined by differences in genes. Meanwhile, High cognitive ability means, more than ever before, that the chances of success in life are good 
and getting better all the time. Putting it all together, success and failure in the American economy and all that goes with it are increasingly a matter of the genes that people inherit. As Mae West said in another context, goodness has nothing to do with it. We are not talking about what should have been, but what has been. The educational system does sort by cognitive ability at the close of the 20th century in a way that it did not at the opening of the century. The upper strata of intelligence are being sucked into a comparatively few occupations in a way that they did not used to be. Cognitive ability is importantly related to job productivity. All of these trends will continue under any social policy. We are optimistic enough to believe that no administration, left or right, is going to impede the education of the brightest or forbid the brightest from entering the most cognitively demanding occupations or find a way to keep employers from rewarding productivity. But we are not so optimistic that we can overlook dark shadows accompanying the trends. As we move on, here is a topic to keep in the back of your mind. What if the cognitive elite were to become not only richer than everyone else, increasingly segregated, and more genetically distinct as time goes on, but were also to acquire common political interests? What might those interests be, and how congruent might they be with a free society? How decisively could the cognitive elite affect policy if it were to acquire such a common political interest? We will return to these issues later. First, we must explore the social problems that might help create such a new political coalition. How much does intelligence have to do with America's most pressing social problems? The short answer is quite a lot, and the reason is that different levels of cognitive ability are associated with different patterns of social behavior. High cognitive ability is generally associated with socially desirable behaviors, low cognitive ability with socially undesirable ones. Generally associated with does not mean coincident with. For virtually all of the topics we will be discussing, cognitive ability accounts for only small to middling proportions of the variation among people. It almost always explains less than 20% of the variance, to use the statistician's term, usually less than 10%, and often less than 5%. What this means in English is that you cannot predict what a given person will do from his IQ score, a point that we have made earlier and will make again, for it needs repeating. On the other hand, despite the low association at the individual level, large differences in social behavior separate groups of people when the groups differ intellectually on the average. We believe that intelligence itself, not just its correlation with socioeconomic status, is responsible for these group differences. Our thesis appears to be radical, judging from its neglect by other social scientists. Could low intelligence possibly be a cause of irresponsible childbearing and parenting behaviors, for example? Scholars of childbearing and parenting do not seem to think so. Could low intelligence possibly be a cause of unemployment or poverty? Only a scattering of economists have broached the possibility. This neglect points to a gaping hole in the state of knowledge about social behavior. It is not that cognitive ability has been considered and found inconsequential, but that it has barely been considered at all. We must add cognitive ability to the mix of variables that social scientists have traditionally used, clearing away some of the mystery that has surrounded the nation's most serious social problems. People must recognize that cognitive ability is an important factor in thinking about the nature of the present problems, whether or not cognitive ability is a cause. For example, if many of the single women who have babies also have low IQ, it makes no difference in one sense whether the low IQ caused them to have the babies or whether the path of causation takes a more winding route. The reality that less intelligent women have most of the out-of-wedlock babies affects and constrains public policy, whatever the path of causation. The simple correlation, unadjusted for other factors, what social scientists call the zero-order correlation, between cognitive ability and social behaviors is socially important. At this point in our analysis, we are limiting the research to whites, and more specifically to non-Latino whites. This is, we think, the best way to make yet another central point. Cognitive ability affects social behavior without regard to race or ethnicity. The influence of race and ethnicity will be dealt with later, but 
But first, we turn to an examination of poverty and other social problems among whites. Who becomes poor? One familiar answer is that people who are unlucky enough to be born to poor parents become poor. There is some truth to this. Whites who grow up in the worst 5% of socioeconomic circumstances are eight times more likely to fall below the poverty line than those growing up in the top 5% of socioeconomic circumstances. But low intelligence is a stronger precursor of poverty than low socioeconomic background. Whites with IQs in the bottom 5% of the distribution of cognitive ability are 15 times more likely to be poor than those with IQs in the top 5%. How does each of these causes of poverty look when the other is held constant? Or, to put it another way, if you have to choose, is it better to be born smart or rich? The answer is unequivocally smart. A white youth who is reared in a home in which the parent or parents are chronically unemployed but who has just average intelligence, an IQ of 100, has nearly 90% chance of being out of poverty by his or her early 30s. Conversely, a white youth born to a solid middle-class family, but with an IQ equivalently below average, faces a much higher risk of poverty, despite his more fortunate background. Among people who are both smart and well-educated, the risk of poverty approaches zero. When it comes to family matters, Rumors of the death of the traditional family have much truth in them for some parts of white American society, those with low cognitive ability and little education, and much less truth for the college-educated and very bright Americans of all educational levels. In this instance, cognitive ability and education appear to play mutually reinforcing but also independent roles. For marriage, the general rule is that the more intelligent get married at higher rates than the less intelligent. This relationship, which applies across the range of intelligence, is obscured among people with high levels of education because college and graduate school are powerful delayers of marriage. Divorce has long been more prevalent in the lower socioeconomic and educational brackets, but this turns out to be better explained by cognitive level than by social status. Illegitimacy, one of the central social problems of the times, is strongly related to intelligence. White women in the bottom 5% of the cognitive ability distribution are six times as likely to have an illegitimate first child as those in the top 5%. One out of five of the legitimate first babies of women in the bottom 5% was conceived prior to marriage, compared to fewer than one out of 20 of the legitimate babies born to women in the top 5%. Even among young women who have grown up in broken homes and among young women who are poor, both of which foster illegitimacy, low cognitive ability further raises the odds of giving birth illegitimately. Low cognitive ability is a much stronger predisposing factor for illegitimacy than low socioeconomic background. At lower educational levels, a woman's intelligence again best predicts whether she will bear an illegitimate child. Toward the higher reaches of education, almost no white women are having illegitimate children, whatever their family background or intelligence. What is the reason for the extremely strong relationship between low IQ and illegitimacy within the population of poor white women? The possibilities bear directly on some of the core issues in the social policy debate. For example, many people have argued that the welfare system cannot really be a cause of illegitimacy because, in objective terms, the welfare system is a bad deal. It provides only enough to squeak by, It can easily trap young women into long-term dependence. And even poor young women would be much better off by completing their education and getting a job rather than having a baby and going on welfare. Therefore, the results we have analyzed could be interpreted as saying that the welfare system may be a bad deal, but it takes foresight and intelligence to understand why. For women without foresight and intelligence, it may seem to be a good deal. Hence, Poor young women who are bright tend not to have illegitimate babies nearly as often as poor young women who are dull. Another possibility fits in with those who argue that the best preventative for illegitimacy is better opportunities. It is not the welfare system that is at fault, people say, but the lack of other avenues. However, poor young women who are bright are getting scholarships or otherwise having positive incentives offered to them, and they accordingly defer childbearing. Poor young women who are dull do not get such opportunities. They have nothing else to do, 
and so have a baby. The goal should be to provide them, too, with other ways of seeing their futures. The American family may be generally under siege, as people often say, but it is at the bottom of the cognitive ability distribution that its defenses are most visibly crumbling, and public policy pushed facts about criminal offenders is that their distribution of IQ scores differs from that of the population at large. Taking the scientific literature as a whole, criminal offenders have average IQs of about 92, eight points below the mean. More serious or chronic offenders generally have lower scores than more casual offenders. The relationship of IQ to criminality is especially pronounced in the small fraction of the population, primarily young men, who constitute the chronic criminals that account for a disproportionate amount of crime. Offenders who have been caught do not score much lower, if at all, than those who are getting away with their crimes. Holding socioeconomic status constant does little to explain away the relationship between crime and cognitive ability. High intelligence also provides some protection against lapsing into criminality for people who are otherwise at risk. Those who have grown up in turbulent homes, have parents who are themselves criminal, or who exhibited the childhood traits that presage crime, are less likely to become criminals as adults if they have high IQ. What is the logic that might lead us to expect low intelligence to be more frequently linked with criminal tendencies than high intelligence is? One chain of reasoning starts from the observation that low intelligence often translates into failure and frustration in school and in the job market. If, for example, people of low intelligence have a hard time finding a job, they might have more reason to commit crimes as a way of making a living. If people of low intelligence have a hard time acquiring status through the ordinary ways, crime might seem like a good alternative route. At the least, their failures in school and at work may foster resentment, toward society and its laws. Perhaps the link between crime and low IQ is even more direct. A lack of foresight, which is often associated with low IQ, raises the attractions of the immediate gains from crime and lowers the strengths of the deterrence which come later if they come at all. To a person of low intelligence, the threats of apprehension and prison may fade to meaninglessness. They are too abstract, too far in the future, too uncertain. Low IQ may be part of a broader complex of factors, an appetite for danger, a stronger-than-average hunger for the things that you can get only by stealing if you cannot buy them, an antipathy toward conventionality, an insensitivity to pain or to social ostracism, and a host of derangements of various sorts combined with low IQ may set the stage for a criminal career. Finally, there are moral considerations. Perhaps the ethical principles for not committing crimes are less accessible or less persuasive to people of low intelligence. They find it harder to understand why robbing someone is wrong, find it harder to appreciate the values of civil and cooperative social life, and accordingly are less inhibited from acting in ways that are hurtful to other people and to the community at large. By now you will already be anticipating the usual caution. Despite the relationship of low IQ to criminality, the great majority of people with low cognitive ability are law-abiding. We will also take this opportunity to note that the increase in crime over the last 30 years, like the increases in illegitimacy and welfare, cannot be attributed to changes in intelligence, but rather must be blamed on other factors which may have put people of low cognitive ability at greater risk than before. In trying to understand how to deal with the crime problem, Much of the attention now given to problems of poverty and unemployment should be shifted to another question altogether, coping with cognitive disadvantage. We will return to this question later when we consider policy changes that might make it easier for everyone to live within the law. Thus far, we have taken on social behaviors one at a time, focusing on causal roles with the analysis restricted to whites. Now we turn to the national scene. This means considering all races and ethnic groups, which leads to the most controversial issues we will discuss. These are ethnic differences in cognitive ability and social behavior, the effects of fertility patterns on the distribution of intelligence, and the overall relationship of low cognitive ability to what has become known as the underclass. Despite the forbidding air that envelops the topic, ethnic differences in cognitive ability are neither surprising nor in doubt. Large human populations differ in many ways, both cultural and biological. It is not surprising that they might differ at least slightly in their cognitive characteristics. That they do, 
is confirmed by the data on ethnic differences in cognitive ability from around the world. Such differences are real and have consequences, but the facts are not as alarming as many people seem to fear. Here is a summary of our findings. East Asians, that is, Chinese and Japanese, whether in America or in Asia, typically earn higher test scores on intelligence and achievement tests than white Americans. The precise size of their advantage is unclear. Estimates range from just a few to ten points. A more certain difference between the races is that East Asians have higher nonverbal intelligence than whites, while being equal, or perhaps slightly lower, in verbal intelligence. Turning to blacks and whites, a difference of approximately 15 IQ points has been observed since intelligence tests began. Attempts to explain the difference in terms of test bias have failed. The tests have approximately equal predictive force for whites and blacks. In the past few decades, the gap between blacks and whites narrowed by perhaps three IQ points. The narrowing appears to have been mainly caused by a shrinking number of very low scores in the black population, rather than an increasing number of high scores. Improvements in the economic circumstances of blacks, in the quality of the schools they attend, in better public health, and perhaps also diminishing racism may be narrowing the gap. The debate about whether and how much genes and environment have to do with ethnic differences remains unresolved. The main point, however, is not who will eventually turn out to be right, but that the answer makes no practical difference in how individuals deal with each other. The real danger is that the elite wisdom on ethnic differences, that such differences cannot exist, will shift to opposite and equally unjustified extremes. Open and informed discussion is the one certain way. To protect society from the dangers of one extreme view or the other. Now for a more detailed analysis. Ethnic differences in measured cognitive ability have been found throughout the century and in many parts of the world. The battle over the meaning of these differences is largely responsible for today's controversy over intelligence testing itself. Our primary purpose is to lay out a set of statements as precise as the state of knowledge permits. About what is currently known about the size, nature, validity, and persistence of ethnic differences on measures of cognitive ability, a secondary purpose is to try to induce clarity in ways of thinking about ethnic differences. For discussions about such differences tend to run away with themselves, blending issues of fact, theory, ethics, and public policy that need to be separated. The first thing to remember is that the differences among individuals are far greater than the differences between groups. If all the ethnic differences in intelligence evaporated overnight, most of the intellectual variation in America would endure. The remaining inequality would still strain the political process, because differences in cognitive ability are problematic even in ethnically homogeneous societies. But the politics of cognitive inequality get hotter, sometimes too hot to handle, when they are attached to the politics of ethnicity. We believe that the best way to keep the temperature down. Is to work through the main facts carefully and methodically. We frequently use the word ethnic rather than race, because race is such a difficult concept to employ in the American context. What does it mean to be black in America in racial terms, when the word black or African American can be used for people whose ancestry is more European than African? How are we to classify a person whose parents hail from Panama but whose ancestry is predominantly African? Is he a Latino? A black. The rule we follow here is to classify people according to the way they classify themselves. The studies of blacks or Latinos or Asians who live in America generally denote people who say they are black, Latino, or Asian. No more, no less. This prompts a second point to be understood at the outset. There are differences between races, and they are the rule, not the exception. That assertion may seem controversial to some listeners, but it verges on tautology. Races are, by definition, groups of people who differ in characteristic ways. Intellectual fashion has dictated that all differences must be denied, except the absolutely undeniable differences in appearance. But nothing in biology says this should be so. On the contrary, race differences are varied and complex, and they make the human species more adaptable and more interesting. So much for preliminaries. Answers to commonly asked questions will follow, beginning with the basics. And moving into successively more complicated issues.
The black-white difference receives by far the most detailed examination because it is the most controversial and has the widest social ramifications. But the most common question we have been asked in recent years has not been about blacks but about Asians. As Americans have watched the spectacular economic success of the Pacific Rim nations at a distance and closer to home, become accustomed to seeing Asian immigrant children collecting top academic honors in America's schools. This leads to our first question. Do Asians have higher IQs than whites? The answer is probably yes, if Asian refers to the Japanese and Chinese, and perhaps also Koreans, whom we refer to here as East Asians. How much higher is still unclear. In our judgment, the balance of the evidence supports the proposition that the overall East Asian mean is higher than the white mean. If we had to put a number on it, three IQ points currently most resembles a consensus, tentative though it still is. Next question. Do blacks score differently from whites on standardized tests of cognitive ability? If the samples are chosen to be representative of the American population, the answer has been yes for every known test of cognitive ability that meets basic psychometric standards of reliability and validity. The answer is also yes for almost all of the studies in which the black and white samples are matched on some special characteristics, samples of juvenile delinquents, for example, or of graduate students. Of course, there are exceptions. Next question. How large is the black-white difference? The usual answer to this question is one standard deviation. A standard deviation is a common language for expressing test scores above and below the mean. For example, for a test distributed normally, a person whose score is one standard deviation below the mean is at the 16th percentile. A person whose score is one standard deviation above the mean is at the 84th percentile. Or, in short, as a measure of distance from the mean, one standard deviation means big, two standard deviations means very big, and three standard deviations means huge. In discussing IQ tests, the black mean is commonly given as 85, the white mean as 100, and one standard deviation as 15. Translated into centiles, this means that the average white person tests higher than about 84% of the population of blacks and that the average black person tests higher than about 16% of the population of whites. A difference of this magnitude should be thought of in several ways. Recall first that the American black population numbers more than 30 million people. Of those, about 100,000 people have IQs of 125 or higher. 100,000 is a lot of people. It should be no surprise to see, as one does every day, blacks functioning at high levels in every intellectually challenging field. It is important to understand as well that a difference of one standard deviation means considerable overlap in the cognitive ability distribution for blacks and whites. For any equal number of blacks and whites, a large proportion have IQs that can be matched up. This is the distribution to keep in mind whenever thinking about individuals. But an additional complication has to be taken into account. In the United States, there are about six whites for every black. At the lower end of the IQ range, there are approximately equal numbers of blacks and whites. But throughout the upper half of the range, the disproportions between the numbers of whites and blacks at any given IQ level are huge. To the extent that the difference represents an authentic difference in cognitive functioning, the social consequences are potentially huge as well. But is the difference authentic? Are differences in black and white test scores attributable instead to cultural bias or other artifacts of the test? We'll examine this question in two ways. First, we'll look for external evidence of bias. Tests are used to predict things, most commonly to predict performance in school or on the job. To use a concrete example, the SAT is used as a tool in college admissions because it has a certain validity in predicting college performance. If the SAT is biased against blacks, it will underpredict their college performance. If tests were biased in this way, blacks as a group would do better in college than the admissions office expected based just on their SATs. It would be as if the test underestimated the true SAT score of the blacks, so the natural remedy for this kind of bias would be to compensate the black applicants by, for example, adding the appropriate number of points onto their scores. This type of predictive bias can work in another way, as when the test is simply less reliable, that is, less accurate, for blacks than for whites. 
Suppose a test used to select police sergeants is more accurate in predicting the performance of white candidates who become sergeants than in predicting the performance of black sergeants. It doesn't underpredict for blacks, but rather fails to predict at all or predicts less accurately. In these cases, the natural remedy would be to give less weight to the test scores of blacks than to those of whites. A key concept for both types of bias is the same. A test biased against blacks does not predict black performance in the real world in the same way that it predicts white performance in the real world. The evidence of bias is external, in the sense that it shows up in differing validities for blacks and whites. External evidence of bias has been sought in hundreds of studies. It has been evaluated relative to performance in elementary school, in secondary school, in the university, in the armed forces, in unskilled and skilled jobs, and in the professions. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is that the major standardized tests used to help make school and job decisions do not underpredict black performance. Nor does the expert community find any other general or systematic difference in the predictive accuracy of tests for blacks and whites. Now let's examine internal evidence of bias. Predictive validity is the ultimate criterion for bias because it involves the proof of the pudding for any test. But although predictive validity is, in a technical sense, the decisive issue, our impression from talking about this issue with colleagues and friends is that other types of potential bias loom larger in their imaginations. These are the many things that are put under the umbrella label of cultural bias. The most common charges of cultural bias involve the putative cultural loading of items in a test. Here is an SAT analogy item that has become famous as an example of cultural bias. Runner is to marathon as, envoy is to embassy, martyr is to massacre, oarsman is to regatta, referee is to tournament, or horse is to stable. The answer is oarsman to regatta. Fairly easy if you know what both a marathon and a regatta are, a matter of guesswork otherwise. How would a black youngster from the inner city ever have heard of a regatta? Many view such items as proof that the test must be biased against people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Clearly, writes a critic of testing, citing this example, this item does not measure students' aptitude or logical reasoning ability, but knowledge of upper middle class recreational activity. In effect, the SAT critic is saying that culturally loaded items are producing at least some of the black white difference. Get rid of such items, and the gap will narrow. Is he correct? When we look at the results for items that have answers such as oarsman regatta, and the results for items that seem to be empty of any cultural information, such as repeating a sequence of numbers, are there any differences? Are differences in group test scores concentrated among certain items? The technical literature is again clear. In study after study of the leading tests, the hypothesis that the black-white difference is caused by questions with cultural content has been contradicted by the facts. Items that the average white test taker finds easy relative to other items, the average black test taker does too. The same is true for items that the average white and black find difficult. Inasmuch as whites and blacks have different overall scores on the average, it follows that a smaller proportion of blacks get right answers for either easy or hard items, but the order of difficulty is virtually the same in each racial group. For groups that have special language considerations, Latinos and American Indians, for example, some internal evidence of bias has been found, unless English is their native language. Studies comparing blacks and whites on various kinds of IQ tests find that the black-white difference is not created by items that ask about regattas or who wrote Hamlet or any of the other similar examples cited in criticisms of tests. How can this be? The explanation is complicated and goes deep into the reasons why a test item is good or bad in measuring intelligence. Here, we restrict ourselves to the conclusion. The black-white difference is wider on items that appear to be culturally neutral than on items that appear to be culturally loaded. This point is well-established empirically, yet comes as a surprise to most people who are new to this topic. In any case, there is no longer an important technical debate over the conclusion that the cultural content of test items is not the cause of group differences in scores. Another issue that demands investigation can best be described as the motivation to try.
Suppose that the nature of cultural bias does not lie in predictive validity or in the content of the items, but in what might be called test willingness. A typical black youngster, it is hypothesized, comes to such tests with a mindset different from the white subjects. He is less attuned to testing situations from one point of view, or less inclined to put up with such nonsense from another. Perhaps he just doesn't give a damn since he has no hopes of going to college or otherwise benefiting from a good test score. Perhaps he figures that the test is biased against him anyway, so what's the point? Perhaps he consciously refuses to put out his best effort because of the peer pressures against acting white in some inner city schools. Despite these suppositions, however, the studies that have attempted to measure motivation in such situations have generally found that blacks are at least as motivated as whites. Other kinds of bias include the possibility that blacks have less access to coaching than whites, less experience with tests, poor understanding of standard English, and that their performance is affected by white examiners. Each of these hypotheses has been investigated for many tests under many conditions. None has been sustained. In short, the testable hypotheses have led toward the conclusion that cognitive ability tests are not biased against blacks. This leaves one final hypothesis regarding cultural bias that does not lend itself to empirical evaluation, at least not directly. It is called uniform background bias. Suppose our society is so steeped in the conditions that produce test bias that people in disadvantaged groups score below their cognitive abilities on all the items on tests, thereby hiding the internal evidence of bias. At the same time, and for the same reasons, they underperform in school and on the job in relation to their true abilities, thereby hiding the external evidence. In other words, the tests may be biased against disadvantaged groups, but the traces of bias are invisible because the bias permeates all areas of the group's performance. To some listeners, this hypothesis will seem so plausible that it is self-evidently correct. Before deciding that this must be the explanation for group differences in test scores, however, let's look more closely. The hypothesis implies that many of the performance yardsticks in the society at large are not only biased. They are all so similar in the degree to which they distort the truth in every occupation, every type of educational institution, every achievement measure, every performance measure, that no differential distortion is picked up by the data. Is this plausible? It is not good enough to accept without question that a general background radiation of bias, uniform and ubiquitous, explains away black and white differences in test scores and performance measures. The hypothesis might, in theory, be true. But given the degree to which everyday experience suggests that the environment confronting blacks in different sectors of American life is not uniformly hostile, and given the consistency in results from a wide variety of cognitive measures, Assuming that the hypothesis is true represents a considerably longer leap of faith than the much more limited assumption that race prejudice is still a factor in American life. Finally, are the differences in overall black and white test scores attributable to differences in socioeconomic status? This question has two different answers depending on how the question is understood and confusion is rampant. We will take up the two answers and their associated rationale separately. First version. If you extract the effects of socioeconomic class, what happens to the overall magnitude of the black-white difference? Blacks are disproportionately in the lower socioeconomic classes, and socioeconomic class is known to be associated with IQ. Therefore, many people suggest, part of what appears to be an ethnic difference in IQ scores is actually a socioeconomic difference. The answer to this version of the question is that the size of the gap shrinks when socioeconomic status is statistically extracted. The trouble is that socioeconomic status is also a result of cognitive ability, as people of high and low cognitive ability move to correspondingly high and low places in the socioeconomic continuum. The reason that parents have high or low socioeconomic status is, in part, a function of their intelligence, and their intelligence also affects the IQ of their children via both genes and environment. Second version. As blacks move up the socioeconomic ladder, do the differences with whites of similar socioeconomic status diminish? The rationale goes like this. Blacks score lower on average because they are socioeconomically at a disadvantage in our society. 
This disadvantage should most seriously handicap the children of blacks in the lower socioeconomic classes, who suffer from greater barriers to education and occupational advancement than do the children of blacks in the middle and upper classes. As blacks advance up the socioeconomic ladder, their children, less exposed to these environmental deficits, will do better and, by extension, close the gap with white children of their class. This expectation is not borne out by the data. IQ scores increase with economic status for both races, but the magnitude of the black-white difference in standard deviations does not decrease. Indeed, it gets larger as people move up from the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. This brings us to the flashpoint of intelligence as a public topic: the question of genetic differences between the races. Expert opinion, when it is expressed at all, diverges widely, and there is a great degree of uncertainty within the scientific community about where the truth lies. We have considered leaving the genetics issue at that, on grounds that no useful purpose is served by talking about a subject that is so inflammatory, so painful, and so far from resolution. We could have cited any number of expert reassurances that genetic differences among ethnic groups are not worth worrying about, and yet. People who call themselves Japanese or Khosa or Caucasians or Maori can still differ intellectually for genetic reasons. We may call them ethnic groups instead of races if we wish, but some ethnic groups nonetheless differ genetically for sure. Otherwise, they would not have differing skin colors or hair textures or muscle mass. They also differ intellectually on the average. The question remaining is whether the intellectual differences overlap the genetic differences to any extent. Our reason for confronting the issue of genetic cognitive differences is not to quarrel with those who deny them. If the question of genetic differences and cognitive ability were something that only professors argued about among themselves, we would happily ignore it here. We cannot do so because, in the public discussion of genes and intelligence, no burden of proof at all is placed on the innumerable public commentators who claim that racial differences in intelligence are purely environmental. This sometimes leads to the next statement, that the differences are therefore inauthentic, and that public policy must be measured against the assumption that there are no genuine cognitive differences between the races. The assumption of genetic cognitive equality among the races has practical consequences that require us to confront the assumption directly. We have further become convinced that the topic of genes, intelligence, and race in the late twentieth century. Is like the topic of sex in Victorian England. Publicly, there seems to be nothing to talk about. Privately, people are fascinated by it. As the gulf widens between public discussion and private opinion, confusion and error flourish. As it was true of sex then, so it is true of ethnic differences in intelligence now. Taboos breed not only ignorance but misinformation. The dangers of the misinformation are compounded by the nature of the contemporary discussion of race. Just beneath the surface of American life, people talk about race in ways that bear little resemblance to the politically correct public discussion conducted in the workplace, dorm rooms, taverns, and country clubs by people in every ethnic group. This dialogue is troubled and often accusatory. The underground conversation is not limited to a racist minority; it goes on everywhere. And we believe it is increasingly shaped by privately held beliefs about the implications of genetic differences that could not stand open inspection. The evidence about ethnic differences can be misused, as many people say to us. Some listeners may feel that this danger places a moral prohibition against examining the evidence for genetic factors in public. We disagree, in part because we see even greater dangers in the current gulf between public pronouncements and private beliefs. The bare answer to the question. Are ethnic differences genetic or environmental? Has three parts. The first part of the answer is that the environment is unquestionably important. This is proved by a wide variety of data, from adoption studies, the life histories of black youths growing up in Georgia, the IQ scores of illegitimate children of German women and black U.S. servicemen following World War II, international comparisons of disadvantaged ethnic groups who are transported to a less punishing environment. And an abundance of other data, but these studies do not prove that the difference is entirely environmental. The second part of the answer is that a serious, legitimate scientific debate is underway regarding the possibility that genes play some role. The evidence is circumstantial. 
For example, there is no longer any scientific doubt that East Asians have an elevated nonverbal IQ, referring to the kinds of skills that make for good engineers and scientists relative to verbal IQ. This is true of East Asians growing up in widely different cultural and economic circumstances in Japan, China, Hong Kong, and Singapore. It is true of East Asians taking tests developed from scratch in their native languages. It is true of fully assimilated East Asian Americans. It is true of East Asian children adopted at birth and brought up in European homes. It is true of Inuit and American Indians whose distant ancestors crossed the land bridge from Asia. The evidence is circumstantial, but it is very difficult to concoct an explanation for the elevated nonverbal IQ of East Asians that ignores the common genetic heritage of these disparate groups. Another line of evidence pointing toward a genetic factor in cognitive ethnic differences is drawn from the profiles of subtest scores for blacks and whites. It is not just that the overall black mean is lower than the white mean, the profiles differ as well. Specifically, the black-white difference systematically tends to be largest on the tests that are the best measures of what is called G, or the general intelligence factor, and G also tends to be the most heritable element of IQ test scores. Once again, the evidence is circumstantial. But by showing that in effect, the better the measure of intelligence, the greater the ethnic difference, this pattern undercuts many of the environmental explanations of ethnic differences that rely on the proposition that the apparent black-white difference is the result of bad tests, not good ones. We do not mention these results in an attempt to claim that a genetic component in ethnic IQ differences has been demonstrated. Rather, we want to stress that the ongoing scientific debate is genuine and legitimate. Simplistic assurances that genes cannot possibly be involved are incorrect. This leads us to the third and most important consideration regarding the controversy over genes and environment. The answer has scientific significance, but it shouldn't make any difference in day-to-day -day life. To show why we believe that it makes next to no difference whether genes are part of the reason for the observed differences, a thought experiment may help. Imagine that tomorrow it is discovered that the black-white difference in measured intelligence is entirely genetic in origin. The worst case has come to pass. What difference would this news make in the way that you approach the question of ethnic differences in intelligence? Not someone else, but you. Ask yourself, if it were known that the black-white difference is genetic, would I treat individual blacks differently from the way I would treat them if the differences were environmental? Probably, human nature being what it is, some people would interpret the news as a license for treating all whites as intellectually superior to all blacks. But we hope that putting this possibility down in words makes it obvious how illogical, besides utterly unfounded, such reactions would be. Many blacks would continue to be smarter than many whites. Ethnic differences would continue to be differences in means and distribution. They would continue to be useless for all practical purposes when assessing individuals. If you were an employer looking for intellectual talent, an IQ of 120 is an IQ of 120, whether the face is black or white, let alone whether the mean difference in ethnic groups were genetic or environmental. If you were a teacher looking at a classroom of black and white faces, you would have exactly the same information you have now about the probabilities that they would do well or poorly. More generally, we cannot think of a legitimate argument why any encounter between individual whites and blacks need be affected by the knowledge that an aggregate ethnic difference in measured intelligence is genetic instead of environmental. The existence of the difference has many intersections with policy issues. The source of the difference has none that we can think of, at least in the short term. Here's one last question. If the differences are genetic, aren't they harder to change than if they are environmental? This question relies on false assumptions about intelligence. The underlying error is to assume that an environmentally caused deficit is somehow less hardwired that it has less impact on real capabilities than does a genetically caused deficit. However, if you were to take two handfuls of genetically identical seed corn and plant one handful in Iowa, the other in the Mojave Desert, and then let nature, that is the environment, take its course, you'll make this discovery. The seeds will grow in Iowa, not in the Mojave, and the unalterable result will have nothing to do with genetic differences. It is true that some kinds of environmentally induced conditions can be changed. 
For example, lack of familiarity with television shows for a person without a television set will probably be reduced by purchasing a television set. But there is no reason to think that intelligence is one of them. Research has shown that an individual's realized intelligence, whether realized through genes or the environment, is not very malleable. Changing cognitive ability through environmental interventions has proved to be extraordinarily difficult. At best, the examples of special programs that have permanently raised cognitive ability are rare. Preschool has borne many of the recent hopes for improving intelligence. However, research has shown that Head Start, the largest program, does not improve cognitive functioning in the long term. Perhaps as time goes on, we will learn so much about the environment, or so much about how intelligence develops, that effective interventions can be designed. But this is only a hope. The essential point to grasp is this: a short person who could have been taller had he eaten better as a child is nonetheless really short. Corn planted in the Mojave Desert that could have flourished if it had been planted in Iowa wasn't planted in Iowa. And there's no way to rescue it when it reaches maturity. Saying that a difference is caused by the environment says nothing about how real it is. In any case, you are not going to learn tomorrow that all the cognitive differences between races are 100% genetic in origin, because the scientific state of knowledge, unfinished as it is, already gives ample evidence that environment is part of the story. But the evidence eventually may become unequivocal that genes are also part of the story. We are worried that the elite wisdom on this issue, for years almost hysterically in denial about the possibility that genes play a role, could, as a result of new evidence, snap too far in the other direction. We believe that it is possible to face all the facts on ethnic and race differences in intelligence and not run screaming from the room. That is our essential message. Differences in cognitive ability that we have discussed play out in public and private life. With profound effects on the demography of intelligence in our society, when people die, they are not replaced one for one by babies who will develop identical IQs. If the new babies grow up to have systematically higher or lower IQs than the people who die, the national distribution of intelligence changes. Mounting evidence indicates that demographic trends are exerting downward pressure on the distribution of cognitive ability in the United States, and that the pressures are strong enough to have social consequences. Putting the pieces together, something is happening that is worth worrying about. Improved health, education, and childhood interventions may hide the demographic effects, but that does not reduce their importance. Whatever good things we can accomplish with changes in the environment would be that much more effective if they did not have to fight a demographic headwind. The falling birth rate is a well-known and widely studied feature of this century throughout the industrialized West. What is less well known, but seems to be true among modern Western cultures, is that declines in lifetime fertility occur disproportionately among educated women, and women of higher social status. We will refer to such women as privileged. Modern societies provide greater opportunities for privileged women to be something other than full-time mothers. Marriage and reproduction are often deferred for education. On the average. Such women spend more of their reproductive years in school because they do well in school, or because their families support their schooling, or both. Negative correlations between fertility and educational status are likely to be the result. Even after the school years, motherhood imposes greater cost and lost opportunities on a privileged woman than on an unprivileged one in the contemporary West. A child complicates having a career, and may make a career impossible. Ironically, even monetary costs work against motherhood among privileged women. By our definition, privileged women have more money than deprived women, but for the privileged woman, a child entails expenses that can strain even a high income, from child care for the infant to the cost of moving when the child gets older to an expensive suburb that has a good school system. In planning for a baby, and privileged women tend to plan their babies carefully, such costs are not considered optional. But what must be spent to raise a child properly? The cost of children is one more reason that privileged women bear few children and postpone the ones that they do bear. Meanwhile, children are likely to impose few opportunity costs on very poor women. A career is not usually seen as a realistic option, and for women near the poverty line in most countries in the contemporary West, a baby is either free or even profitable. 
depending on the specific terms of the welfare system in her country. Whatever the reasons, and whatever the variations from community to community, the reality in the modern West is that reproductive rates are negatively correlated with income and educational levels, which are themselves correlated with intelligence. People with lower intelligence are out-reproducing people with higher intelligence. Immigration is an even older American tripwire for impassioned debate than differential fertility. Recently, the debate has intensified as the large influx of immigrants in the 1980s, legal and illegal, has reopened all the old arguments. Those who favor open immigration policies point to the adaptability of earlier immigrant populations and their contribution to America's greatness. Anti-immigrationists instead emphasize the concentration within some immigrant groups of people who commit crimes, fail to work, drop out of school, and go on public assistance. As we examine the evidence, we must acknowledge that Latino and black immigrants are, at least in the short run, putting some downward pressure on the distribution of intelligence. Many listeners will find this result counterintuitive. The concept of the high-achieving immigrant is deeply ingrained in Americans' view of our country. But think back to the immigrant at the turn of the century. America was the land of opportunity, but that was all. There were no guarantees, no safety nets. One way or another, an immigrant had to make it on his own. Add to that the wrench of tearing himself and his family away from a place where his people might have lived for centuries, the terrors of having to learn a new language and culture, often the prospect of working at jobs he had never tried before, and the United States had going for it a crackerjack self-selection mechanism for attracting immigrants who were brave, hard-working, imaginative, self-starting, and probably smart. Immigration can still select for those qualities, but it does not have to. Someone who comes here because his cousin offers him a job, a free airplane ticket, and a place to stay is not necessarily self-selected for those qualities. On the contrary, immigrating to America can be, for that person, a much easier option than staying where he is. The nation is at a fork in the road. It is easy to understand the historical and social reasons why nobody wants to talk about the demography of intelligence. Our purpose is to point out that the stakes are large and that continuing to pretend that there is nothing worth thinking about is as reckless as it is foolish. There is no major domestic issue for which the news we bring is irrelevant. Do we want to persuade poor single teenagers not to have babies? The knowledge that 95% of poor teenage women who have babies are also below average in intelligence should prompt skepticism about strategies that rely on abstract and far-sighted calculations of self-interest. Do we favor job training programs for chronically unemployed men? Any program is going to fail unless it is designed for a target population, half of which has an IQ below 80. Do we wish to reduce income inequality? If so, we need to understand how the market for cognitive ability drives the process. Do we aspire to a world-class educational system for America? Before deciding what is wrong with the current system, we had better think hard about how cognitive ability and education are linked. Let us consider intelligence and educational reform in more detail. Most people think that American public education is in terrible shape, and any number of allegations seem to confirm it. But a search of the data does not reveal that the typical American school child in the past would have done any better on tests of academic skills. In fact, an American youth with an average IQ is probably better prepared academically now than ever before. The problem with American education is confined mainly to one group of students, the cognitively gifted. Among the most gifted students, SAT scores started falling in the mid-1960s, and the verbal scores have not recovered since. One reason is that disadvantaged students have been in and gifted students out for 30 years. Even in the 1990s, only one-tenth of one percent of all the federal funds spent on elementary and secondary education go to programs for the gifted. Because success was measured in terms of how well the average and below-average children performed, American education was dumbed down. Textbooks were made easier, and requirements for courses, homework, and graduation were relaxed. These measures may have worked, as intended, for the average and below-average students, but they let the gifted get away without ever developing their potential. In thinking about policy, the first step is to realize where we are. In a universal education system, many students will fall short of basic academic competence. 
The average student has little incentive to work hard in high school. Getting into most colleges is easy, and achievement in high school does not pay off in higher wages or better jobs for those who do not go to college. On a brighter note, realism also leads one to expect that modest improvements in the education of average students will continue, as they have throughout most of the century. In trying to build on this natural improvement, the federal government should support greater flexibility for parents to send their children to schools of their choosing, whether through vouchers, tax credits, or choice within the public schools. Federal scholarships should reward academic performance. Some federal funds, now so exclusively devoted to the disadvantaged, should be reallocated to programs for the gifted. But we urge primarily not a set of new laws; rather, we urge a change of heart within the ranks of educators. Until the latter half of this century, it was taken for granted that one of the chief purposes of education was to educate the gifted, not because they deserved it through their own merit, but because, for better or worse, the future of society was so dependent on them. It was further understood that this education must aim for more than technical facility; it must be an education that fosters wisdom and virtue through the ideal of the educated man. All that we ask is that educational leaders rededicate themselves to the duty that was once at the heart of their calling, to demand much from those fortunate students to whom much has been given. As we turn the discussion from education to affirmative action, it is important to understand that our society has dedicated itself to coping with a particular sort of inequality by trying to equalize outcomes for various groups. Thereby, the country has retreated from older principles of individual equality before the law, and has adopted policies that treat people as members of groups. Our contribution, we hope, is to calibrate the policy choices associated with affirmative action to make the costs and benefits clearer than they usually are. Affirmative action on the university campus needs, at last, to be discussed as it is actually practiced, not as the rhetoric portrays it. Our own efforts to assemble data on a secretive process leads us to conclude that affirmative action, as it is currently practiced, cannot survive public scrutiny. The edge given to minority applicants to college and graduate school is not a nod in their favor in the case of a close call, but an extremely large advantage that puts black and Latino candidates in a separate admissions competition. On elite campuses, the average black freshman is in the region of the tenth to fifteenth percentile. Of the distribution of cognitive ability among white freshmen, nationwide, the gap seems to be at least that large, perhaps larger. The gap does not diminish in graduate school; if anything, it may be larger yet. In the world of college admissions, Asians are a conspicuously unprotected minority. At the elite schools, they suffer a modest penalty, with the average Asian freshman being at about the 60th percentile of the white cognitive ability distribution. Our data from state universities are too sparse to draw conclusions. In all the available cases, the difference between white and Asian distributions is small, either plus or minus, compared to the large differences separating blacks and Latinos from whites. The edge given to minority candidates could be more easily defended if the competition were between disadvantaged minority youths and privileged white youths. But nearly as large a cognitive difference separates disadvantaged black freshmen from disadvantaged white freshmen. Still more difficult to defend, blacks from affluent socioeconomic backgrounds are given a substantial edge over disadvantaged whites. There is no question that affirmative action has worked, in the sense that it has put more blacks and Latinos on college campuses than would otherwise have been there. But this success must be measured against costs. When students look around them. They see that blacks and Latinos constitute small proportions of the student population, but high proportions of the students doing poorly in school. The psychological consequences of this disparity may be part of the explanation for the increasing racial animosity, and the high black dropout rates that have troubled American campuses. In society at large, a college degree does not have the same meaning for a minority graduate and a white one, with consequences that reverberate in the workplace and continue throughout life. It is time to return to the original intentions of affirmative action, to cast a wider net, to give preference to members of disadvantaged groups, whatever their skin color, when qualifications are similar. Such a change would accord more closely with the logic underlying affirmative action, with the needs of today's students of all ethnic groups, and with progress toward a healthy 
multiracial society. We have similar concerns regarding affirmative action in the workplace. Employers want to hire the best workers. Employment tests are one of the best and cheapest selection tools at their disposal. But since affirmative action began in the early 1960s, and especially since a landmark decision by the Supreme Court in 1971, employers have been tightly constrained in the use they may make of tests. The most common solution is for employers to use them, but to hire enough protected minorities to protect themselves from prosecution and lawsuits under the job discrimination rules. The rules that constrain employers were developed by Congress and the Supreme Court based on the assumptions that tests of general cognitive ability are not a good way of picking employees, that the best tests are ones that measure specific job skills, that tests are biased against blacks and other minorities, and that all groups have equal distributions of cognitive ability. These assumptions are empirically incorrect. Paradoxically, job hiring and promotion procedures that are truly fair and unbiased. Will produce the racial disparities that public policy tries to prevent. Have the job discrimination regulations worked? The scholarly consensus is that they had some impact on some kinds of jobs in some settings during the 1960s and into the 1970s, but have not had the decisive impact that is commonly asserted in political rhetoric. It also appears, however, that since the early 1960s. Blacks have been overrepresented in white-collar and professional occupations relative to the number of candidates in the IQ range from which these jobs are usually filled, suggesting that the effects of affirmative action policy may be greater than usually thought. The successes of affirmative action have been much more extensively studied than the costs. One of the most understudied areas of this topic is job performance. The scattered data suggests that aggressive affirmative action does produce large racial discrepancies in job performance in a given workplace. It is time that this important area be explored systematically. In coming to grips with policy, a few hard truths have to be accepted. First, there are no good ways to implement current job discrimination law without incurring costs in economic efficiency and fairness to both employers and employees. Second, after controlling for IQ. It is hard to demonstrate that the United States still suffers from a major problem of racial discrimination in occupations and pay. As we did for affirmative action in higher education, we present the case for returning to the original conception of affirmative action. This means scrapping the existing edifice of job discrimination law. We think the benefits to productivity and to fairness of ending the anti-discrimination laws are substantial. But our largest reason for wanting to scrap job discrimination law is our belief that the system of affirmative action in education and the workplace alike is leaking a poison into the American soul. This nation does not have the option of ethnic balkanization. The increasing proportions of ethnic minorities, Latino, East Asian, South Asian, African, East European, make it more imperative, not less, that we return to the melting pot as metaphor. And color blindness as the ideal. Individualism is not only America's heritage; it must be its future. In speculating about the impact of cognitive stratification on American life and government, certain tendencies seem strong enough to worry about. To recapitulate, these are: an increasingly isolated cognitive elite, a merging of the cognitive elite with the affluent, a deteriorating quality of life. For people at the bottom end of the cognitive ability distribution, unchecked, these trends will lead the U.S. toward something resembling a caste society, with the underclass mired ever more firmly at the bottom, and the cognitive elite ever more firmly anchored at the top, restructuring the rules of society so that it becomes harder and harder for them to lose. Among the other casualties of this process would be American civil society as we have known it. Like other apocalyptic visions, this one is pessimistic, perhaps too much so. On the other hand, there is much to be pessimistic about. When a society reaches a certain overall level of affluence, the haves begin to feel sympathy toward, if not guilt about, the condition of the have-nots. Thus dawns the welfare state, the attempt to raise the poor and the needy out of their plight. In what direction does the social welfare system evolve when a coalition of the cognitive elite and the affluent continues to accept the main tenets of the welfare state, 
but is increasingly frightened of and hostile toward the recipients of help. When the coalition is prepared to spend money, but has lost faith that remedial social programs work. The most likely consequence, in our view, is that the cognitive elite, with its commanding position, will implement an expanded welfare state for the underclass that also keeps it out from underfoot. Our label for this outcome is the custodial state. Should it come to pass, here is a scenario. Over the next decades, it will become broadly accepted by the cognitive elite that the people we now refer to as the underclass are in that condition through no fault of their own, but because of inherent shortcomings about which little can be done. Politicians and intellectuals alike will become much more open about the role of dysfunctional behavior in the underclass, accepting that addiction, violence, unavailability for work, child abuse, and family disorganization will keep most members of the underclass from fending for themselves. It will be agreed that the underclass cannot be trusted to use cash wisely. Therefore, policy will consist of greater benefits, but these will be primarily in the form of services rather than cash. Furthermore, there will be new restrictions. Specifically, these consequences are plausible. Child care in the inner city will become primarily the responsibility of the state. The homeless will vanish from our public spaces, and perhaps the clinically borderline cases that now constitute a high proportion of the homeless will be required to reside in shelters. Strict policing and custodial responses to crime will become more acceptable and widespread. The underclass will grow and become even more concentrated spatially than it is today. Perhaps most disturbingly, it is possible that racism will re-emerge in a new and more virulent form. The tension between what the white elite is supposed to think and what it is actually thinking about race will reach something close to a breaking point. This pessimistic prognosis must be contemplated. When the break comes, the result, as so often happens when cognitive dissonance is resolved, will be an overreaction in the other direction. Instead of the candor and realism about race that is so urgently needed, the nation will be faced with racial divisiveness and hostility that is as great or greater than America experienced before the Civil Rights Movement. We realize how outlandish it seems to predict that educated and influential Americans who have been so puritanical about racial conversation will openly revert to racism. We would not go so far as to say it is probable. It is, however, more than just possible. If it were to happen, all the scenarios for the custodial state would be more unpleasant, more vicious, than anyone can now imagine. In short, by custodial state we have in mind a high-tech and more lavish version of the Indian Reservation for some substantial minority of the nation's population while the rest of America tries to go about its business. In its less benign forms, the solutions will become more and more totalitarian. Benign or otherwise, going about its business, in the old sense, will not be possible. It is difficult to imagine the United States preserving its heritage of individualism, equal rights before the law, and free people running their own lives, once it is accepted that a significant part of the population must be made permanent wards of the state. If we wish to avoid this prospect for the future, we cannot count on the natural course of events to make things come out right. Now is the time to think hard about how a society in which a cognitive elite dominates and in which below-average cognitive ability is increasingly a handicap can also be a society that makes good on the fundamental promise of the American tradition, the opportunity for everyone, not just the lucky ones, to live a satisfying life. That is the task to which we now turn, beginning with a fundamental question. How should policy deal with the twin realities that people differ in intelligence for reasons that are not their fault, and that intelligence has a powerful bearing on how well people do in life. The answer of the 20th century has been that government should create the equality of condition that society has neglected to produce on its own. The assumption that egalitarianism is the proper ideal, however difficult it may be to achieve in practice, suffuses contemporary political theory. Socialism, communism, social democracy and America's welfare state have been different ways of moving toward the egalitarian ideal. The phrase social justice has become virtually a synonym for economic and social equality. Until now, these political movements have focused on the evils of systems in producing inequality. Human beings are potentially pretty much the same, the dominant political doctrine has argued, 
except for the inequalities produced by society. These same thinkers have generally rejected, often vitriolically, arguments that individual differences such as intelligence are to blame. We would like to present for your consideration another way of thinking about equality and inequality. It represents an older intellectual tradition than social democracy or even socialism. In our view, it is also a wiser tradition, more attuned to the way in which individuals go about living satisfying lives and to the ways in which societies thrive. The more specific policy conclusions to which we will then turn cannot be explained apart from this underpinning. For thousands of years, great political thinkers of East and West tried to harmonize human differences. For Confucius, society was like his conception of a family, extensions of a ruling father and obedient sons, devoted husbands and faithful wives, benign masters and loyal servants. People were defined by their place, whether in the family or the community. So too for the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers. Place was all. All the great religious traditions define a place for everyone, if not on earth, then in heaven. Society was to be ruled by the virtuous and wise few. The everyday business of the community fell to the less worthy multitude with the most menial chores left to the slaves. Neither the Greek Democrats nor the Roman Republicans believed that all men are created equal, nor did the great Hindu thinkers of the Asian subcontinent, where one's work defined one's caste, which in turn circumscribed every other aspect of life. The ancients accepted the basic premise that people differ fundamentally and importantly and searched for ways in which people could contentedly serve the community or the monarch or the tyrant or the gods rather than themselves despite their differences. Philosophers argued about obligations and duties, what they are and on whom they fall. In our historical era, political philosophers have argued instead about rights. They do so because they are trying to solve a different problem. The great transformation from a search for duties and obligations to a search for rights may be dated to Thomas Hobbes, writing in the mid-1600s about a principle whereby all people, not just the rich and well-born, might have equal rights to liberty. His successor in English political thought, John Locke, conceived of people in a state of nature as being in a state also of equality, and sought to preserve that condition in actual societies through a strictly limited government. What Locke propounded is especially pertinent here because it was his theory that the American founders brought into reality. Locke recognized that there are cognitive differences among people and was strikingly harsh in his judgment about their size, but that does not mean he believed people to have different rights. People are equal in rights, Locke proclaimed, though they be unequal in everything else. Those rights, however, are negative rights, to impose contemporary terminology, they give all human beings the right not to have certain things done to them by the state or by other human beings, not the right to anything except freedom of action. This way of putting it is out of tune with the modern sensibility. Today, the original concept of equal rights is said to be meaningless cant, outmoded. Taking equal rights seriously, it is thought, requires enforcing equal outcomes. The prevailing political attitude is so dismissive toward the older conception of equal rights that it is difficult to think of serious public treatments of it. The founders just didn't think hard enough about that problem, it seems to be assumed. We are asking that you consider the alternative, that the founders were fully aware of how unequal people are, that they did not try to explain away natural inequalities, and that they nonetheless thought the best way for people to live together was under a system of equal rights. The founders wrote frankly about the inequality of men, for Thomas Jefferson, it was obvious that they were especially unequal in virtue and intelligence. The other founders, including Hamilton and Washington, also ruminated about the inequality of men and the political implications of that inequality. In doing so, they were following an ancient tradition. Political philosophers have always begun from the understanding that good policy must be in accordance with what is good for human beings and that what is good for humans must be based on an understanding of how they are similar and how they differ. The founders saw that making a stable and just government was difficult precisely because men were unequal in every respect except their right to advance their own interests. The task of government was to set unequal persons into a system of laws and procedures that would, as nearly as possible, equalize their rights while allowing their differences to express themselves.
the result would not necessarily be serene or quiet, but it would be just, and it might even work. In reminding you of these views of the men who founded America, we are not appealing to their historical eminence, but to their wisdom. We think they were right. The egalitarian ideal of contemporary political theory underestimates the importance of the differences that separate human beings. It fails to come to grips with human variation. It overestimates the ability of political interventions to shape human character and capacities. People who are free to behave differently from one another in the important affairs of daily life inevitably generate the social and economic inequalities that egalitarianism seeks to suppress. To reduce inequality of condition, the state must impose greater and greater uniformity. In our view, the logic of the egalitarian ideal ultimately leads to tyranny. The same atmosphere prevails on a smaller scale wherever equality comes to serve as the basis for a diffuse moral outlook. Consider the many small tyrannies in America's contemporary universities, where it has become objectionable to say that some people are superior to other people in any way that is relevant to life and society. Nor is this outlook confined to judgments about people. In art, literature, ethics, and cultural norms, differences are not to be judged. Such relativism has become the moral high ground for many modern commentators on life and culture. We think that rights are embedded in our freedom to act, not in the obligations we may impose on others to act. That equality of rights is crucial, while equality of outcome is not. That concepts such as virtue, excellence, beauty, and truth should be reintroduced into moral discourse. We are comfortable with the idea that some things are better than others, not just according to our subjective point of view, but according to enduring standards of merit and inferiority. And at the same time, we reject the thought that we, or anyone else, should have the right to impose those standards. We are enthusiastic about diversity, the rich, unending diversity that free human beings generate as a matter of course, not the imposed diversity of group quotas. As we approach the policy implications of all we have discussed so far, we bring to our recommendations a predisposition. Believing that the original American conceptions of human equality and the pursuit of happiness still offer the wisest guidance for thinking about how to run today's America. Let us return to our original question. How should policy deal with the twin realities that people differ in intelligence for reasons that are not their fault and that intelligence has a powerful bearing on how well people do in life? The answer turns us back to the ancient concern with place. The broadest goal is a society in which people throughout the functional range of intelligence can find and feel they have found a valued place for themselves. For valued place, we offer a pragmatic definition. You occupy a valued place if other people would miss you if you were gone. The fact that you would be missed means that you are valued. To have many different people who would miss you in many different parts of your life and at many levels of intensity is a hallmark of a person whose place is well and thoroughly valued. One way of thinking about policy options is to ask whether they aid or obstruct this goal of creating valued places. The great bulk of the American population is amply equipped in their cognitive resources and in other personal characteristics to find valued places in society. We must emphasize that because through much of this program we have focused on people at the two tails of the bell curve. Now is a good time to recall the people in the broad part of the curve between the extremes. The prevalence of the social maladies we reviewed was strikingly concentrated in the bottom IQ deciles. By the time people were even approaching average IQ, the percentages of people who were poor, had babies out of wedlock, provided poor environments for their children, or exhibited any other problem constituted small percentages of the population. Translated into the themes we are about to introduce, the evidence supports the proposition that most people by far have enough intelligence for getting on with the business of life. We believe the policies we advocate will benefit them as well by creating a generally richer and more vital society, but it should be made explicit. Our solutions assume that the average American is an asset, not part of the problem. Nonetheless, millions of Americans have levels of cognitive ability low enough to make their lives statistically much more difficult than life is for most other people. How may policy help or obstruct them as they go about their lives?
Our thesis is that it used to be easier for people who are low in ability to find a valued place than it is now. In a simpler America, being comparatively low in the qualities measured by IQ did not necessarily affect the ability to find a valued niche in society. Many such people worked on farms. People who would score eighty or ninety on an IQ test could be competent farm workers, not conspicuously distinguished from most other people in wealth, home, neighborhood, or status in the community. Much the same could be said of a wide variety of skilled and unskilled trades. Inevitably, with technological advances, the niches for the less intelligent have shrunk. Out of the myriad things that have changed since the beginning of the century, two overlapping phenomena have most affected people with modest abilities. It has become harder to earn a living to support the valued roles of spouse, parent, and neighbor, but even more importantly. Functions have been stripped from one main source of valued place: the neighborhood. Communities are rich and vital places to the extent that they engage their members in the stuff of life: birth, death, raising children, making a living, helping friends, coping with problems, setting examples, welcoming, chastising, celebrating, and negotiating. If there is one theme on which both observers from left and right recently sound very much alike. It is that something vital and important has drained out of American communities. Most adults need something to do with their lives other than going to work, and that something consists of being stitched into a fabric of family and community. The cognitive elite may not detect the declining vitality in the local community. Their lives are centered outside a geographic community. Their professional associates and friends may be scattered over miles of suburbs, or for that matter, across the nation and the world. For large segments of American society, however, the geographic neighborhood is the major potential resource for infusing life with much of its meaning. The massive transfer of functions from the locality to the government has stripped neighborhoods of their traditionally shared tasks. Instead, we have neighborhoods that are merely localities, not communities of people tending to their communal affairs. Valued places in a neighborhood are created only to the extent that the people in a neighborhood. Have valued tasks to do. Thus arises our first general policy prescription: a wide range of social functions should be restored to the neighborhood when possible, and otherwise to the municipality. The reason for doing so is not to save money, not even because such services will be provided more humanely and efficiently by neighborhoods, though we believe that generally to be the case, but because this is one of the best ways to multiply the valued places that people can fill. In a decent post-industrial society, neighborhoods shall not have lost their importance as a source of human satisfactions and as a generator of valued places that all sorts of people can fill. Government policy can do much to foster the vitality of neighborhoods by trying to do less for them. Our second policy prescription proposes a simplification of rules. As of the end of the 20th century, the United States is run by rules that are congenial to people with high IQs. And that make life more difficult for everyone else. This is true in the areas of criminal justice, marriage and divorce, welfare and tax policy, business law, among others. It is true of rules that have been intended to help ordinary people, rules that govern schooling, medical practice, the labeling of foods. In looking for examples, the 1040 income tax form is such an easy target that it need only be mentioned to make the point. But the same complications and confusions apply to a single woman with children seeking government assistance, or a person who is trying to open a dry cleaning shop. These systems have been created bit by bit over decades by people who think that complicated, sophisticated operationalizations of fairness, justice, and right and wrong are ethically superior to simple black and white versions. Additionally, complex systems are precisely the ones that give the cognitive elite the greatest competitive advantage. Deciphering complexity is one of the things that cognitive ability is most directly good for. Our policy recommendation is to strip away the nonsense, return to the assumption that in America the government has no business getting in people's way, except for the most compelling reasons, with compelling required to meet a stiff definition. Simpler rules would also make it easier for people to lead virtuous lives. We start with the supposition that almost everyone is capable of being a morally autonomous human being most of the time, and given suitable circumstances, this reflects an old but lately unfashionable truth: that human beings in general are capable of deciding between right and wrong.
This does not mean, however, that every one is capable of deciding between right and wrong with the same sophistication and nuances. The difference between people of low cognitive ability and the rest of society may be put in terms of a metaphor. Every one has a moral compass, but some of those compasses are more susceptible to magnetic storms than others. For example, imagine living in a society where the rules about crime are simple and the consequences are equally simple. Crime consists of a few obviously wrong acts. Assault, rape, murder, robbery, theft, trespass, destruction of another's property, fraud. Someone who commits a crime is probably caught and almost certainly punished. The punishment almost certainly hurts, therefore it is meaningful. Punishment follows arrest quickly within a matter of days or weeks. The members of the society subscribe to the underlying codes of conduct with enthusiasm and near unanimity. They teach and enforce them whenever appropriate. Living in such a world, the moral compass shows simple, easily understood directions. North is north, south is south, right is right, wrong is wrong. Now, imagine that all the rules are made more complicated. The number of acts defined as crimes has multiplied so that many things that are crimes are not nearly as obviously wrong as something like robbery or assault. The link between moral transgression and committing crime is made harder to understand. Fewer crimes lead to an arrest. Fewer arrests lead to prosecution. Many times the prosecutions are not for something the accused person did, but for an offense that the defense lawyer and the prosecutor agreed upon. Many times, people who are prosecuted are let off, though everyone, including the accused, acknowledges that the person was guilty. When people are convicted, the consequences have no apparent connection to how much harm they have done. These events are typically spread out over months and sometimes years. The two worlds we have described are not far removed from the contrast between the criminal justice system in the United States as recently as the 1950s and that system as of the 1990s. We are arguing that a person with comparatively low intelligence, whose time horizon is short and ability to balance many competing and complex incentives is low, has much more difficulty following a moral compass in the 1990s than he would have had in the 1950s. Put aside your feelings about whether these changes in the criminal justice system represent progress. Simply consider them as a magnetic storm as a set of changes that make the needle pointing to right and wrong waver erratically if you happen to be looking at the criminal justice system from the perspective of a person who is not especially bright. Our policy prescription is that the criminal justice system should be made simpler. The meaning of criminal offenses used to be clear and objective, and so were the consequences. It is worth trying to make them so again. Of all the uncomfortable topics we have explored, a pair of the most uncomfortable ones are that a society with a higher mean IQ is also likely to be a society with fewer social ills and brighter economic prospects, and that the most efficient way to raise the IQ of a society is for smarter women to have higher birth rates than duller women. Instead, America is going in the opposite direction, and the implication is a future America with more social ills and gloomier economic prospects. These conclusions follow directly from the evidence we have presented, and yet we have so far been silent on what to do about it. We are silent partly because we are as apprehensive as most other people about what might happen when a government decides to social engineer who has babies and who doesn't. We can imagine no recommendation for using the government to manipulate fertility that does not have dangers. But this highlights the problem. The United States already has policies that inadvertently social engineer who has babies, and it is encouraging the wrong women. If the United States did as much to encourage high IQ women to have babies as it now does to encourage low IQ women, it would rightly be described as engaging in aggressive manipulation of fertility. The technically precise description of America's fertility policy is that it subsidizes births among poor women who are also disproportionately at the low end of the intelligence distribution. We urge generally that these policies represented by the extensive network of cash and services for low-income women who have babies, be ended. The government should stop subsidizing births to anyone, rich or poor. The other generic recommendation, as close to harmless as any government program we can imagine, is to make it easy for women to make good on their prior decision not to get pregnant by making available birth control mechanisms that are increasingly flexible, foolproof, inexpensive, and safe. The other demographic factor we discussed earlier was immigration, 
and the evidence that recent waves of immigrants are, on the average, less successful and probably less able than earlier waves. An immigrant population with low cognitive ability will, again on the average, have trouble not only finding good work but have trouble in school, at home, and with the law. We believe that the main purpose of immigration law should be to serve America's interests. It should be among the goals of public policy to shift the flow of immigrants away from those admitted under the nepotistic rules, which broadly encourage the reunification of relatives, and toward those admitted under competency rules already established in immigration law, not to the total exclusion of nepotistic and humanitarian criteria, but a shift. Perhaps our central thought about immigration is that present policy assumes an indifference to the individual characteristics of immigrants that no society can indefinitely maintain without danger. At the beginning of this program, we asked the question, what good can come from understanding the relationship of intelligence to social structure and public policy? We have tried to answer this question in many ways. Our first answer has been implicit. For 30 years, vast changes in American life have been instituted by the federal government to deal with social problems. We have tried to point out what a small segment of the population accounts for such a large proportion of those problems. To the extent that the problems of this small segment are susceptible to social engineering solutions at all, they should be highly targeted. The vast majority of Americans can run their own lives just fine, and policy should, above all, be constructed so that it permits them to do so. Our second answer, also implicit, has been that just about any policy in any area, education, employment, welfare, criminal justice, or the care of children, can profit if its designers ask how the policy accords with the wide variation in cognitive ability. Policies may fail not because they are inherently flawed, but because they do not make allowances for how much people vary. There are hundreds of ways to frame bits and pieces of public policy so that they are based on a realistic appraisal of the responses they will get, not from people who think like Rhodes Scholars, but from people who think in simpler ways. Our third answer has been that group differences in cognitive ability, so desperately denied for so long, can best be handled, can only be handled, by a return to individualism. A person should not be judged as a member of a group, but as an individual. With that cornerstone of the American doctrine once again in place, group differences can take their appropriately insignificant place in affecting American life. But until that cornerstone is once again in place, the anger, the hurt, and the animosities will continue to grow. Once, we as a nation absorbed people of different cultures, abilities, incomes, and temperaments into communities that worked. The nation was good at it precisely because of, not in spite of, the freedom that American individuals and communities enjoyed. Have there been exceptions to that generalization? Yes, predominantly involving race, and the nation rightly moved to rid itself of the enforced discrimination that lay behind those exceptions. Is the generalization nonetheless justified? Overwhelmingly so, in our judgment. Reducing that freedom has enervated our national genius for finding valued places for everyone. The genius will not be revitalized until the freedom is restored. Cognitive partitioning will continue. It cannot be stopped because the forces driving it cannot be stopped. But America can choose to preserve a society in which every citizen has access to the central satisfactions of life. Its people can, through an interweaving of choice and responsibility, create valued places for themselves in their worlds. They can live in communities, urban or rural, where being a good parent, a good neighbor, and a good friend will give their lives meaning and purpose. They can weave the most crucial safety nets together so that their mistakes and misfortunes are mitigated and withstood with a little help from their friends. All of these good things are available now to those who are smart enough or rich enough if they can exploit the complex rules to their advantage, buy their way out of the social institutions that no longer function, and have access to the rich human interconnections that are growing, not diminishing, for the cognitively fortunate. We are calling upon our listeners to recognize the ways in which public policy has come to deny these good things to those who are not smart enough and rich enough. At the heart of our thought is the quest for human dignity. The central measure of success for this government, as for any other, is to permit people to live lives of dignity, not to give them dignity, 
for that is not in any government's power, but to make it accessible to all. That is one way of thinking about what the founders had in mind when they proclaimed, as a truth self-evident, that all men are created equal. That is what we have in mind when we talk about valued places for everyone. Inequality of endowments, including intelligence, is a reality. Trying to pretend that inequality does not really exist has led to disaster. Trying to eradicate inequality with artificially manufactured outcomes has led to disaster. It is time for America once again to try living with inequality as life is lived. Understanding that each human being has strengths and weaknesses, qualities we admire and qualities we do not admire, competencies and incompetencies, assets and debits, that the success of each human life is not measured externally but internally, that of all the rewards we can confer on each other, the most precious is a place as a valued fellow citizen. This presentation of The Bell Curve, written by Richard J. Hernstein and Charles Murray, is a Simon & Schuster audio program. The Bell Curve is also available in hardcover from the Free Press.